Thanks so much for having me here. Uh, it's a real honor to be around uh, so many people and for me to have benefited so much from the downstream effects of Dr. Janetta's legacy. Uh, spreading from the first speaker on this panel, Dr. Lunsford, who gave me my job here, along with being such a luminary in neurosurgery as a resident all those years ago. Um, and uh, all the way to uh, Nduka, my partner with whom I share a practice, who's a real uh, rising star. Um, some fun stuff from the past here. Uh, this, used to, this picture used to hang around the ICUs uh, when I started here. Uh, obviously, Dr. Janetta over here, uh, Peter, Howard Jonas, Bill Welch, and Don Marion, uh, numerous others. And I look at that as kind of history, but now I realize that uh, some of my history is becoming history. Um, this is when I was a junior resident, uh, being but mentored by people who were giants to me. Uh, of course, Al Scaro. Uh, John was at Children's at the time, John Lee, who's here, uh, who was uh, my senior and my chief. Um, of course, uh, my friend Paul, Jim, Mel, um, uh, and Anand and uh, Matt, a lot of people who've had great influences on me. Um, I want to talk about iatrogenic brain injury, uh, trying to minimize the damage we do with surgery, which is a real interest of mine. Uh, just recognizing that you know, our first role as physicians is not to hurt people, and we think of our report cards as our MRIs in terms of degree of resection and what we take out. A lot of times we don't talk about the collateral damage. All you have to do is open up Dura and look at brain and it causes damage. That's all it takes. And um, so how do we minimize that? And this is something that, that Dr. Janetta had some interest in. Uh, he did have interest not only in the clinical realm of developing his own retractor with the adapters to put special blades on it uh, to try to maximize visualization and as well as uh, numerous uh, microsurgical innovations, uh, but also basic science research looking at uh, neurophysiologic changes in a 1977 publication, Stroke, uh, following brain retraction. At what point does this affect blood flow? Um, these have been questions for a long time. And so one of the ways we look at that in the clinical realm is through this port surgery, uh, which is a, a, a modification of techniques initially established by, by Dr. Patrick Kelly. Uh, using a cylindrical tube to, to uh, minimize um, retraction by uniform distribution through a small tube. And uh, I think that if you look at the, at the progression of brain surgery over the years, over the millennia, there has been a trend uh, to smaller holes, more delicate operations. And I don't think that that ends here. Uh, despite the other um, innovations that we've made with microsurgery, uh, I think that there are uh, better places for us to go to try to continue to do better procedures through, through less invasive manners uh, where we're actually removing tissue. And obviously this is controversial, uh, um, uh, ways that we have to minimize our, our brain injury, whether it be through microsurgery or, or cylindrical tube retraction or, or through endoscopy. Uh, using tubular retractors, we can do smaller cordisectomies. Uh, you can visualize brain tissue through a transparent tube. Uh, you can change direction easily. You can prevent some repeat cortical trauma from coming in and out with patties. On the other hand, it's continuous retraction throughout the procedure. And uh, if it's a long procedure, that's an issue, and there's less freedom for your hands. It's harder than, than standard microsurgery. Um, Dr. Joe is here, obviously, and one of his uh, many contributions was using his collapsed transparent vinyl tubular retractor uh, and then inflating this uh, to remove interventricular lesions and colloid cysts. There, there are numerous others. There are many on the market. Uh, I owe a great debt of gratitude not only to Patrick Kelly for his work in this, but also to Dr. Lunsford for designing and bringing the endoscopic ports that we're using clinically at Pitt that many of you have some uh, experience with, uh, 13 millimeter retractor of various lengths. Uh, probably most useful in the ventricle. Uh, where there's this natural uh, conduit of the ventricular space that can be easily converted into an air medium for manipulation by manual microsurgery, also certainly done in the parenchyma uh, deeply. And we have established a pretty substantial experience doing this with, with colloid cysts, where you can very definitively do colloid cyst removal still through a very uh, minimally invasive approach, and other interventricular tumors. Uh, most of these being relatively low-grade tumors that when symptomatic and uh, that, they, that they do require surgical intervention. Uh, Subependymomas, meningiomas when they grow in the ventricle and you can work back to the ventricular body still through a transcoronal approach to resect these. Um, and then some tumors where, where you really worry about cortical and subcortical injury 
the, this monster kept me up at night uh, trying to figure out how to do this safely uh, in a woman who had started developing speech uh, difficulty related to this, this six centimeter meningioma in, in the trigon of the left lateral ventricle. And uh, ultimately, uh, I felt that the port gave us a nice option to try to minimize the cortical and subcortical manipulation. There are other issues where smaller tumors can start to uh, grow in a younger patient and where you have a lot of concerns about how you might hurt somebody to, to intervene on something like this, in this case with the optic radiations, and you can, you can integrate fiber tracking into your planning so that you can do a proper surgery to try to avoid injuring those radiations, thinking of essentially what we call cannulography, uh, trying to avoid those radiations, integrating them into your image guidance, then using that to, to do your resection. Well, that's all great, and those are cases that went nicely, but of course, we're still even when it goes perfectly, we're, we're leaving footprints. Sometimes the footprints are larger than this. And uh, if you actually look at the fiber tracks, you can make out those footprints. And there's also a lot of limitations. There are a lot of cases that are still best done without a port. Uh, this pair of hippocampal lesion in a woman who presented with seizures, rather than, than transgress all this tissue, because I wasn't going to take a skull base approach with a port, you can go subtemporally and then work up towards the pair of hippocampal gyrus and using uh, um, uh, fluorescein to visualize the tumor, that can actually help you to see the tumor light up as you're resecting it. And it's also easier to integrate with ultrasound. It's very hard to use an ultrasound through small ports. Fortunately, this tumor really lit up brightly, uh, and it's one of those applications where the yellow 560 filter helped. And um, this is one of the benefits of my experience of knowing to attack this in this way and not trying to do it with a port, which I probably would have done about five years ago. Um, so we're looking at ways to try to avoid the shear injury, and we've actually employed stereotactically placed brain needles, specifically these backland needles, which is slightly larger than a needle you'd use for brain biopsy. That's a 2.6 millimeter diameter needle with an inner cannula that you can then replace with a cigar-shaped balloon catheter. So this, um, this Boston Scientific catheter can actually be inflated if you use that to replace your inner catheter. So rather than the usual cannulation where we're kind of trying to minimize shear injury, passing this port in, uh, almost like the hull of a ship with this bullet-shaped dilator, you can actually, this is frameless so you can see it better, place a brain needle, replace the inner cannula with a balloon, blow up the balloon, and then come in with your port. And this can also be done with a stereotactic frame. And our preliminary results of this has been good. And again, this is just a step. This is a step in the direction of us trying to do smaller holes. I, I, I want to start doing uh, selected brain tumors through a burr hole. I think smaller cameras uh, better ultrasounds, better resection tools. Uh, we can start working through smaller and smaller holes for the patients who need it. And um, uh, that's pretty much it. Hope I stayed in my time. Thanks.